series. Today we have Dr. Luis Cuervo, the international, uh, the Senior Advisor for Research at PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization. Um, before we begin, we will have an introduction from Mr. Carl Punai, who is from the NCI Office of Science Planning and Assessment. And afterwards, Dr. Cuervo will present. So thank you so much for coming. Good morning. Thanks for joining us and for bearing with us. Um, welcome to NCI's uh, Center for Global Health Seminar Series. Uh, today's presentation is by Dr. Luis Gabriel Cuervo. Uh, Dr. Cuervo is trained as a physician, holds a Master of Science in Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics uh, from the Universidad Javeriana and is uh, qualified as a specialist in family medicine at the Universidad de Baje. Uh, Dr. Cuervo currently serves as a senior advisor for research promotion and development at the Pan American Health Organization. Today's presentation focuses on how the landscape for health research has been transformed recently in Latin America uh, with the emergence of new tools, uh, collaborative research, and the integration of scientific research findings into health policy and healthcare delivery. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Cuervo. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, Carl, and uh, Akira, and Melissa, and Christopher for all the arrangements for this presentation today. Appreciate it very much. Uh, I work for the Pan American Health Organization, and the, the Pan American Health Organization is the oldest uh, public health international organization uh, in the world. It started 110 years ago, and um, and uh, it started uh, to, to a great extent with all the concerns that were about yellow fever and the uh, and the Panama Canal was being built, and, um, and uh, that's when there was a realization that uh, health issues were international issues, that, uh, that, that diseases would move along. And, and basically, when the World Health Organization uh, was established, then it was decided to avoid duplication and just have uh, PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, to also be the regional office for the Americas of the World Health Organization. So it serves, it has it works kind of two hats as a specialized agency for health of the inter-American system and the regional office for the Americas of the World Health Organization. Okay, um, what we're going to talk about today is pretty much about uh, research management, how to organize what is being done to organize research and to facilitate that people can use and produce research that makes a difference in their places. And uh, the, these first images are about the Panama Canal. And we, use them. we have a, an art exhibit. It's called the Art for Search uh, Exhibition. And uh, the Art for Search ex Exhibition has, uh, uh, we've done it with two different artists. One is a documentary photographer, Jane Dempster, who took these images. And the other one is a portrait photographer, museum photographer, um, Theo Chalmers. And uh, where we highlight champions, people that have through their passion and energy made a big difference in making things happen. But we wanted to highlight how important is research in terms of um, social and economic development. And that is what we want. We, we, don't want. we don't pursue research per se because it's nice to do research. We pursue research because it can make a difference in social and economic development for the countries and improving people's lives. And the Panama Canal is a beautiful example because um, uh, it, it, has, it affects our life every day still. And if without research for health, the Panama Canal could, could not have been built. It underpins the economy of Panama, and it was a key in the strategic positioning of the U.S. in the 20th century. These are a couple of champions from the Theo Chalmers exhibit. And um, I'll focus perhaps on, on the one to the right, Pedro Kahn. Uh, the other one is Rolf Foginas, who's a neuroscientist. Uh, so some of you might, might have met him. Um, who's doing research on Alzheimer's disease, uh, looking at uh, how the brain of uh, squids work. But um, Pedro Kahn's research has been about taking an effective intervention, antiretrovirus, and making it available to everybody uh, to a point where this condition that it was going to break the bank, having HIV AIDS, um, was going to break the bank for the health systems uh, 30 years ago, and it was a, a death sentence. And nowadays, a person with HIV AIDS, uh, if they have access to antiretrovirus, they can live a normal life or a near normal life. And that completely changed and uh, made this population to be able to contribute to society and, and have a good life. 
So that is the sort of uh, story that we want to, to, to stress, and we use art to tell those stories and to persuade the economic sector that they should invest more in, in research for health. Um, so, so the emphasis, and this is the kind of ideolo ideological part behind all this, is that uh, what we have here at the base of this hourglass are the policies on research for health, the international policies on research for health. And I'm highlighting three, and the three of them are quite recent. The first ones were the strategy and plan of action on and intellectual property, um, public health and intellectual property rights, and the policy on research for health that we have here at the center. And then a year later in, in 2010, uh, WHO's uh, World Health Assembly approved the strategy on research for health. But of course the policies would do nothing if, if there's no champions behind it to implement what the policy proposes. And what these policies focus on is basically strengthening the health research systems, which is what you have here. So you have the different uh, building blocks of the health research system, a capable workforce, uh, clear policies, information, knowledge, and communication, the structure and regulatory framework, well-equipped institutions, and uh, financial resources. And uh, the idea of the health research systems in the countries, and this is how it's placed in, in the countries of our region, is that they support the health system itself. So you have the, the building blocks of the health system on the top. But all this is for one purpose, so we have healthy populations. Now, it all happens in an environment where you have determinants of health, and many of those are outside of the health system itself. So when you look at the main causes of uh, injury, for example, in a region, uh, road traffic accidents, and many of the interventions um, are not done in the health system, in, in the health system itself. You have to work with the other uh, sectors, with transport and so on. But this is how we can support that there's a functional health system, and, and, uh, and that's the idea of the health research systems. So the policy um, on research for health, which is uh, kind of our guiding document, and this, this was agreed by all the member states uh, in the Americas. So we're talking from Canada to the southern tip of uh, South America. Uh, all the countries agreed on implementing this policy in research for health. It has uh, six main objectives. Uh, we'll go through them very quickly. Uh, we summarize them on these bullets, quality, governance, human resources, partnerships, standards, and impact. Let's look at uh, what they mean, uh, what, uh, how they're spelled out. So in terms of uh, governance, it's to strengthen research governance and promote the definition of research agendas. In terms of quality, the focus of the policy okay, some water, to promote the generation of ethical, relevant, and quality research. In terms of human resources, improve the competencies and support for human resources involved in research. A partnership to seek efficiencies and enhance the impact and appropriation of research through effective and strategic alliances, collaboration, and the building of public trust and engagement in research. And um, in terms of standards, to foster best practices and enhance standards for research. And finally, the impact, to promote the dissemination and utilization of research findings. So if we go back to the uh, hourglass slide, what I want to highlight here is that what we've proposed is that knowledge translation becomes the catalyst for the whole process of strengthening the national health research systems. Because you cannot do knowledge translation if you don't have all the system, of the, all the system working. So basically that's become uh, the, the, a pillar of the implementation of the policy, developing those capacities in the countries to take research findings and implement them into policies and, and practice. So now I'm going to focus on a couple of uh, aspects. I'm not going to go through the whole policy, but uh, to, to focus on governance and the impact aspects of the policy, uh, because those highlight some of the key initiatives that we have for better research management. So uh, in terms of governance, uh, the, the focus has been, or to tell you a little bit about how, how we ended up here, is basically when we were visiting our countries, you'd go uh, and ask, uh, what capacities do you have to do research here in Guatemala? And uh, typically the answer would be, oh, we have no capacity to do anything here in Guatemala. Do you have ethics review committees? Well, I know of one, but uh, I, don't, I don't think we have many. They, they, they basically, we didn't know what the landscape was. So much of the focus to be able to have some research management and some governance has been to gather the information so that you know what's missing and what's available 
and make the best use of what's available. And to, to do that, um, we work in partnerships. I, I was showing this as a system, so when I'm talking about uh, an objective like governance, actually we're talking, we're touching on each of the other objectives anyway. And we work in partnerships with CORET and with the Ministries of Health of Brazil and, Pan and uh, Panama later and Mexico and uh, other partners, Welcome Trust. And we brought together uh, high-level technical delegates from science and technology and the health sector. And uh, we asked them to tell us about how their national health research systems worked. And with that information, we populated a wiki page, meaning a website where people can, can put information themselves. Everybody can contribute to it. So we created a critical mass of information about the national health research systems, and then from thereafter, people have been populating that site and contributing to it. So we can organize the information about governance and policies, priorities on research for health, research institutions, um, ethics review committees, so on and so forth, and I'll show you a little bit about that. And um, one person, we, we then took that information back to them. We've do, been doing a little bit of analysis and updating it. And uh, so we have done those in these conferences, the first Latin American Conference on Research and Innovation for Health, the follow-up meeting, and the second conference, which was last year in Panama. And as a person from Central America put it uh, to us. Uh, he said, we knew we had a problem, but we didn't know where to start. And now that we have mapped out how the national health research system should be built, we know what's missing and we know where to act. So this is actionable information, and I think that's the uh, a key element. The, the web page, uh, all, the, all, the, all the sites I'm going to show here and all the resources can be accessed in, in our first, um, in the address that I put in the first slide. Sorry, I'm going to go back so you can take note of it because that, that is the one stop shop to, to access, and it's this one. Pajo.org slash research portal. That will take you to all the, the information we're going to share today. So let's go back to where we were. And this is how the um, a screenshot of the health research web for the Americas, and you can see there's a molecule there that has the information organized according to, to the different um, components that we have there, so the policies and so on. And having that information has allowed us to do some first analysis. This is one that was published in 2009 of uh, 14 countries, and we have now one that's uh, um, sent for publication. We will have an update for 2012 of uh, the, how the national health research systems work in the region. Um, the information and the interface works in the four languages of our region, meaning English, Spanish, Portuguese, and French. And this is uh, the kind of maps that you can get also from, you can get information from individual countries or you could get a map like this one. And this map had less, just like five uh, bullets on the left uh, uh, three years ago. Those are the policies on research for health. We haven't done a very good work of disseminating this yet, so you go to the countries and ask who has a policy in research for health in this country, and nobody raises their hand. Most of the countries in the region have a policy in research for health now, and most of those countries now have also an agenda on research for health, priorities defined, and not that that always on its own makes a difference, but if you are going to engage in a partnership or send a grant uh, application, of course, it should be good to show that it responds to the needs of your country. And we have also been able to map uh, the ethics review committees in the region and uh, for Latin America and the Caribbean. Actually, we work for the whole region, that's, that's for Latin America and the Caribbean. I focus here on Latin America and the Caribbean because I understood that was the interest, but also because for these maps, the response we've got from there has been much more than what we have had from Canada and the U.S. So if you look at the maps, it looks like if there was not much going on here, but uh, it's just because nobody has going into the task of uploading information about your institutions. But these are the ethics review committees in the region. You can download the whole database. It's all open. You can actually go uh, home in into a specific uh, area and get the information, uh, even the, the address of the ethics review committees where they're based, how they're constituted, if they're in a hospital, in, in a center. Um, so you can, for example, look at uh, Central America. And this screenshot, we found uh, 58 in Central America. Oh, sorry, I didn't change the map there. And uh, we took uh, these two meetings, like the Net Tropic meeting in Honduras, and they took from there and they provided information about the centers. Uh, so keeping this up to date and putting the information about your institutions there is very, very simple, because basically just putting the links and very little additional information to write or, or uploading documents. 
So if you are talking about the policies and research for health, people just have to put the link to the published version or to the authorized version or the web page in the Ministry of Health. That should be usually enough. And uh, this allows to do a little bit of analysis or find where they are located, the centers. And uh, it's quite intuitive, yet we have done uh, some tutorials. These are in Spanish, uh, and we were inspired by Apple in doing our tutorials. So we decided to do very short tutorials that were usually three to five minutes and very simple, like the ones done in, in, in Apple. And uh, there's uh, also a uh, an article that just came out in Caderno de Saúde Pública from Brazil, which is a, an indexed uh, journal, and uh, it tells, it's in English, and it's telling how the system works and uh, inviting people to use it more. Another aspect of research management that we found was critical was clinical trials. There's a lot of clinical trials taking place in a region. We don't know always where they're done, how they're done. We wanted to know more about them, and uh, something that uh, instigated all this movement of registering clinical trials was uh, the lawsuits uh, that came uh, uh, with, for example, with um, uh, antidepressants in New York, and uh, later with rofecoxib, uh, an anti-inflammatory drug, where the complaint was that there was some information that was being concealed from the public and from, the, from everybody, basically about outcomes that were assessed in these clinical trials but were not uh, presented up right in the results. An agreement was reached in 2003 between uh, different stakeholders, including the WHO who convened the meeting, that uh, for each clinical trial at least 20 variables needed to be um, disclosed. And the industry also agreed on it and all the different partners, and uh, those 20 variables are pretty simple, and um, they are telling who, you know, who's the main uh, researcher, What's the name of the study? When does it start? When does it expect? To, when do we expect it will end? Uh, what are the outcomes that you're going to be assessing? What are the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Uh, so it's kind of very basic information. And the way this was set up was uh, allows to capture the information from uh, registers that are already there. So for the purposes of, of this, we are talking of clinical trials as research studies that pr pr prospectively assign human participants or groups of humans to one or more health-related interventions to evaluate the effects of health outcomes. And uh, WHO established some uh, uh, criteria for this and then started inviting registries to participate in this, which is kind of a, it's a meta-register. Uh, if I would use a symbol, I would say it's like a Google for clinical trials. It captures information that other people produce and puts it available in an integrated way for everybody. So this is WHO's ICTRP, International Clinical Trial Registry Platform, and um, this is how the web page looks like at the, the beginning of it, and it has a section to search for trials, and it has a section to search for trials in children, and it has, we have actually three data providers from this region, uh, clinicaltrials.gov as a data provider, and as uh, validated uh, providers of data, so we have the Cuban uh, Clinical Trial Registry and the Brazilian Clinical Trial Registry. Not all countries want to have their own registry because they, they think it's not worth having a, their own registry. Some want to have it for different reasons. They want to capture additional information. But some just want to put legislation uh, that means that uh, you have to register the trial. That's a matter of where it is as long as it has its standards. We have four other countries that you have here in the map to your right that are working now to have uh, clinical trials, Argentina, Chile, uh, Peru, and Colombia. But when you think about Central America, probably they don't want to have their own registry because the amount of clinical trials doesn't justify having two or three people hired just to do registration. So those probably do work as a subregion or we'll have a regional uh, registry for them uh, providing the service. So we get the information from primary registries and clinicaltrials.gov and that data is provided um, then into um, the database. And to give you an idea, we have around 180,000 uh, clinical trials now uh, at this time of the year, coming from 15 primary registries and clinical trials that cost. And this is the, the list of uh, some of those, including the European one. And this is updated for some um, on, on a monthly basis, for some it's uh, on a fortnightly basis. And you can make searches there very quickly. So I did one just for the demonstration today. For Central America, I found 439 clinical trials. Uh, of those, 103 are in kids. 
and uh, 173 are currently recruiting participants uh, of those 38 kits. And you can get the information for each clinical trial. You can touch on, uh, on the hyperlink there and get all the information from the variables. And that has allowed, of course, to understand a little bit more how uh, clinical trials are being done in the region, who's funding them. Uh, in some countries, most of them are funded by industry. In some countries, most, most of them are being funded by the government. That changes from one country to another one. These are not one slides. I took them from Ludovic Reves and he lent them for the presentation. But basically, he's looking at maternal mortality. So he went there and, and pulled out the information of maternal mortality and found 150 clinical trials and found that uh, 65% of those done in this region are from Brazil, and 13% are multinational. So we can start learning a little bit about how this works and what kind of topics they are addressing. And similarly, uh, um, I think it's uh, Joshua who's working on, on neglected diseases, and, and uh, you can get a similar picture. So you can go there and, and learn a lot about what's being done in the countries or who's the expert on what field, uh, because all that information can be pulled out uh, from the clinical trial registry. And this is what has happened with clinical trial registration since we began. So clinicaltrial.gov uh, was there from early on, and there was a lot of information already available there. And there were the other trials, but we have been following what has been the trend on registration since we started with the ICTRP. And what you can see is, is the total number of clinical trials has been growing steadily, and the number of uh, clinical trials that are recruiting, meaning the new ones, uh, has been growing as well. So people are registering new clinical trials. There's incentives for this, like you don't get your paper pub published if you didn't register. And in some countries, we're getting the funding institutions and regulatory authorities to also use the clinical trial registry. So for example, you don't get your disimbursement made for your study unless you have registered. Or the ethics review committee, which is the case in PAHO, will not approve your proposal until you have registered your proposal. Um, and uh, some uh, regulatory authorities are working on, like, they require that the clinical trials used to support uh, the inclusion of a new technology uh, are registered. And if you look at the clinical trials in Latin America, this is how it goes for the country. So you can see that Brazil takes the lead. All of them are growing steadily, but Brazil is really uh, pulling everybody else. And uh, these are clinical trials in children. So that's the kind of information that we can now get that uh, two, three years ago was impossible to to pull together. Now, in terms of impact, how do, do we make sure that people can use uh, the research uh, findings? And uh, we know that there is a big gap between uh, researchers and policymakers that we always talk about. Why do these guys don't use this if we have shown through trials that it works so well? The policymakers at the same time, well, I cannot wait two or three years for someone to do a study to answer a question I have to answer tomorrow to the press. How, how we can bridge that. And uh, one of the key initiatives in summarizing evidence uh, that I want to use as a uh, to showcase here is uh, the Cochrane Collaboration. Probably you've heard about it. It has uh, around 30,000 volunteer people doing summaries of research evidence. It started mostly on the clinical field. It's now moving more into public health and, uh, and other uh, things like health systems research and equity issues. But it has a lot of uh, clinical uh, research behind it. Well, the person who started the Cochrane Collaboration, or inspired the Cochrane Collaboration, was Archie Cochrane. He didn't start this, he inspired it. Archie Cochrane was the Secretary of Health of the United Kingdom. His concern was that there was a lot of research there, and people kept doing research about the same issues. So there was a moral imperative to use that research and not to expose people to new interventions, for example, without knowing if they work when all the information was there, but nobody was pulling it together. So Archie Cochran was one of the key, key people in, do, in this info, in, in promoting that others came and started working on the methods to do research synthesis and to summarize research and to move from having the kind of parochial and anecdotal research being guiding our decisions to having access to the global evidence once we had the, the systems, the information technology systems that allowed us to do that. Uh, so, so uh, another aspect that has been uh, becoming a, a challenge is as, as we grow, of course, we realize that uh, to have impact in health, in most cases, the interventions go beyond the health sector. So, so just to illustrate some examples, if you're going to work on violence, like the, on, on the slide on the, on the right, at the bottom on the right, or food safety, or um, the major determinants, having access to clean water and uh, having good hygiene, uh, well, then you have to work with other 
health sectors, and that's key for policy development. So uh, what we have been working on lately with uh, very good partners uh, is in developing strategies that allows us to do that knowledge translation for policies, specifically for policies, because that is different to what you do in the clinic. Uh, this is far more complex because you have to do look at values, you have to do at opportunities, of political opportunity, the cost of the interventions, what the community thinks about them, and how to get all the information about the key issues uh, in a timely manner and adequately packaged so that policymakers can make a decision. Uh, to give you um, an example, that, um, if you want to reduce maternal mortality, there was an example in, in, in um, Brazil that the emphasis was reducing maternal mortality. And the key issues was that the personnel was rotating all the time. So the people with the knowledge was being lost all the time, and that was reflected in women with uh, low risk having 10 prenatal controls and women with high risk having none. And uh, they started looking at how they could keep uh, their personnel from rotating and, and, and make them, you know, feel happier at work. And they looked at the evidence behind different interventions for that. And then they present them as options to the policymakers, to the Secretary of Health or the Municipal Secretary of Health. Like this is what happens if you hire your, your staff uh, by salary or you hire your staff by performance uh, related pay or, you know, different three or four different options. And they can look at what, how that's going to have different effects. So we'll, we'll look at them briefly. So we have been developing standards of, of how to translate research findings into policy. And this on the left is an example of those that support tools for evidence-informed policy making. If you are going to scale up a program for prevention of cancer or the papillomavirus vaccine, how you can do it. Uh, so the, the, that's kind of a reference panel that we have there. And we've been working with other initiatives like the Equator Network that tells people how to, uh, what are the standards for publishing research results uh, to increase the, the likelihood that people get their research findings published. That's a, a big issue in most of Latin America and the Caribbean, and also because of language issues. But uh, the one of the big challenges if you don't have people don't grow, don't get trained as frequently and how to get things published, and they have more challenges on getting their research findings out there. So that's uh, part of the work we're doing. And then promoting uh, standards like the one on the bottom right of how to incorporate into systematic reviews aspects that allow people to do analysis about equity issues how this is going to affect different populations, how this is going to affect vulnerable populations. And uh, we've tried to put also the information all into one site. This is the evidence portal. It's based in Videme. Videme is like the National Library of Medicine for Latin America and the Caribbean. It has access to a lot of virtual libraries organized by country, organized by topics. So if you want to read about adolescents, you can go and find a virtual health library on adolescents or toxicology or uh, if you want to read about uh, things relevant to Colombia, then you can find a section about Colombia. But you can search all in one single place and get all the information according to the different virtual libraries. And this is a virtual library for evidence, and it has access, for example, full access, uh, full text access in English and Spanish to the Cochrane database uh, and to other resources that you have there. And soon it's going to have access also to uh, health um, systems evidence. Uh, which is the top database if you want to look at health systems issues, how to scale up programs, implement, uh, address issues of funding, of governance. That's the key database, the best one that you'll find. So basically those standards is part of the work we do to guide people how to uh, support evidence-informed policymaking, identifying the needs, finding and assessing the evidence, and going from research evidence to decisions. And those processes are tested, and we have an initiative that does this. It's called the Evidence-Informed Policy Network, EVIPNET. It's uh, active in 44 countries. We have it here in the Americas. And EVIPNET is being kind of the catalyst for the whole process of developing the national health research systems because it's a knowledge translation platform. That is why we did the evidence portal, so that people using EVIPNET could find all the evidence they needed in one single site. That is why we have partnered with McMaster to have the health systems evidence available in all the languages of the region. So people can go there and pull out information about governance arrangements, financial arrangements, delivery arrangements or implementation for their programs so that the interventions that you develop here, for example, can be scaled up into policies and into the practice around the world. So that's the, uh, if we have time at the end, uh, we can do a quick search here and, and show you what you, the kind of uh, documents you'll find, like uh, how to scale up a program on cancer, what works better 
screening in different settings, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I just uh, did a screenshot for, to illustrate. So I went into one of the documents I, I found when I did a, a search for interventions um, for cancer. And this is, for example, all, all of the documents in that database, which has uh, around 8,500 documents. Most of them are systematic reviews or policy briefs. And uh, all of them come with a summary of one page, and they have been graded also for quality. Uh, so this tells you which countries are participating in the study, in this case, the USA, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Switzerland, Taiwan. This is a systematic review tells you how many studies have contributed from each of the countries to that systematic review. It has a quality assessment with answer. Uh, I know out of 11, that's a very high, so it's probably a very good study. And it tells you about interventions to improve continuity of care in the follow-up of patients with cancer. So that's the kind of, of uh, evidence uh, that you find there for health systems research. And uh, the way it works is basically we go to the countries uh, that are interested in this. They have to apply for it. They have to put resources behind it. And uh, we invite them to build teams. And those teams you typically have someone from the Ministry of Health championing and science and technology, the academia, research centers involved. And uh, in those teams, we help the team develop the skills to do the knowledge translation process. Someone has to be able to uh, develop the expertise on, on doing the searches, for example, for the evidence and the different kinds of evidence. So clinical trials is quite straightforward, I would say. But go and look for evidence on costs and go and look for the evidence of political opportunity, and you need to look at different sources. So those skills have to be developed in those teams. And then we accompany them. We take them uh, by the hand and do their first policy brief, which is one of the thing, first things they do, a systematic review, policy brief. And they use that to go and have a discussion with the different key stakeholders in their locality of, um, like, if we're going to implement three different options, which ones would you go for? Can we combine them? Shouldn't we combine them? And um, help them look at the different aspects so that the policymaker knows where he's, he or she is standing with the different stakeholders. Not looking at consensus, but knowing what does the union think about the, the, the new proposal to increase uh, the quality of care in, in this hospital? What does the, what did the doctor think? What did the patient representative think? And uh, what you have here on the left uh, side is a map of the countries where currently we have this initiative uh, working, the EVIDNET, and on the top is just a reference uh, from the Lancet to the initiative, so um, if one wants to have a quick look at how it works. And this is how it works in the practice for us. Basically, uh, to give you, uh, to illustrate, Dominican Republic had a problem with uh, the quality of water and sanitation. They were asking PAHO for technical support on how can we improve access to water and sanitation with a human rights perspective. So we first did a systematic review, which is here, and the systematic review provided evidence that could be used in other places because the evidence usually translates well from one place to another one. But the implementation is different in every place. The, the characteristics of Dominican Republic and Guatemala are so different when it comes to implementation. But the evidence was here, and that evidence was used to inform then the policy dialogues, the deliberative the, the dialogues, which uh, this is the, how the report looks like. And all that information was used then to, to take it to the uh, Rio Plus 20 uh, discussions. And in Rio Plus 20, they looked at the evidence and what was being discussed, and basically they decided to include water as a determinant of health from their own words. And uh, that has been used also to develop a task force, an uh, evidence-informed task force uh, for the control of cholera and Hispanola in the island uh, where Haiti and Dominican Republic are, are located. So it's, we started from the evidence into getting into the policy, the high-level policy, then with Rio Plus 20, and then into uh, a, a technical program to reduce cholera in Hispaniola. And these are uh, reports of policy dialogues and deliberative um, and policy briefs, sorry, and deliberative dialogues. And the value of showing the reason why I bring them is because this is not work done necessarily by our team here in headquarters. Uh, most of these are done by the countries. This is something that was done by a team based in Chile, and they want to know how to finance uh, uh, treatments uh, for diseases in Chile. Of course, this is not work that uh, we're not talking here of research done at the bench, but if you cannot get this working, then you are not having the impact of that research that was done at the bench. 
Uh, this one was fascinating. This is uh, in Peru. Their team implemented the guidelines that WHO gave them to reduce anemia in children. And they were monitoring because that's part of the process. And what they found was anemia was staying, uh, you know, it was level or was actually getting worse. It was not getting better. And they were doing what WHO was telling them to do. So they looked at what was the issue, and they found that there was an issue of actually of adherence. People were not taking the treatments that were given. There were a lot of cultural issues that were not considered in the implementation, and their work was on how to improve adherence to, uh, to the micronutrients to uh, reduce anemia in kids from 6 to 36 months old. And we have the follow-up of that, and the follow-up that is that now it, has, it is having a lot of impact, and WHO took the lessons learned from there to improve the way that adherence is looked at in the different countries where they are being implemented. So uh, to illustrate, these are the titles of some of the policy briefs that are finished now. And you look at different regions doing on different topics. Some are clinical, some are very much uh, research uh, management of, of the health sector. Um, violence, micronutrients, you have different things there. Uh, dengue control, treatment of uh, financing options for rare disease in Chile, which you already saw. And these are the ones that are currently under development. We actually do have a group working in the U.S. It's in the U.S.-Mexico border, and it's on, on, so they are looking at different topics, especially on obesity and control of diabetes. And this is an example from PDPD, which is a municipality in Brazil where the, the uh, Secretary of Health, who is not a medic, the Secretary of Health in PDPD is a, a lawyer, decided to implement this. And uh, this is the example I was telling you of uh, how they were hiring the people and uh, the, the evidence that they found in the policy brief uh, guided them to choose a different way of hiring people, and now the rotation of personnel has been reduced. And what we focus on is on the process, that the process is right. We are not expecting to see always a, a health impact because that takes too long usually and we don't have the resources to do it. But it's beautiful to see that in PDPD we already have some health impact because what you see is that the arrow is showing when they started implemented, implementing the recommendations about how to hire and how to uh, locate the right people in the right place for the, um, to reduce uh, perinatal mortality. Uh, a policy brief like this one looks just like a triptych. You open it, and it has three or four columns according to the options, and uh, just a very short paragraph for each one. Like, you know, this is how much it's going to cost you. This is, these are the risks involved. This is what the community thinks. This is the expected impact of the intervention. And, uh, and so it's an evidence-informed decision for the policymaker who usually will not have time to read all the studies. And all this we do through partnerships. So we seek efficiencies uh, through these partnerships. And all, those, all that work has been done with different partners, uh, like um, Universidad Católica Chile, McMaster, Wellcome Trust, and, and, and many others. Uh, other examples of partnerships we have with TDRC, the Iman Pajo, uh, a train the trainers scheme to train uh, people in teams doing research in Latin America and the Caribbean on how to manage the research. And that has enabled us to train over 350 researchers and uh, more than 45 trainers and to set up training centers in uh, uh, Jamaica for the Caribbean, in Honduras for Central America, in Cali, Colombia for uh, the Andean region, and in Brazil. So. Uh, they, they, they are running more or less autonomous now, and, uh, and the idea is to train these teams on how to better do research management. Or with the Canadian Cochrane Center, we have, for example, webinars, um, different aspects of the implementation of research, how to summarize research, where to find the evidence, both for the clinical and the uh, health system research aspects, and how to report research, and so on and so forth. So those are just some few examples. And more recently, with the National Cancer Institute and the NIH, uh, we participated in a workshop that was convened by the NCI, NIH, and the Ministry of Health of Colombia. It was done in Bogota, and it invi they invited by um, competition, uh, by, uh, by a competitive selection process, 60 influential and capable research partners um, from the Andean uh, region, Central America, and 30 were from Colombia. And uh, the idea was to, to give them information and capacity so that they are more successful when they apply for grants here at the NIH. Uh, we also have support uh, from the NCI uh, recently from, um, uh, with uh, having a delegate our advisory committee on health research, Luis Alejandro Salicrup, joined us there a month ago in, in uh, Hamilton. 
and um, we invited John Davis here for a lecture that was on, uh, done at the Stone House at the Bethesda campus. And John Davis is a guru of, uh, of uh, health system research. So he came and gave a lecture about how to take research findings into policy level. And he's the chair for knowledge translation at McMaster. And uh, we are talking now about uh, actually having some day, and I invite you if you have any inspiring ideas about this, of having the art research exhibits here at the um, NIH. It would be very nice to have them here. They've been around the world, uh, but we haven't had it in, in, in Washington yet. So um, the, the last slide is this one. And in this last slide, what I had was uh, some ideas of what I thought could open a discussion in the 10, 15 minutes we have of how how we could partner or support your work. What we have there were tools. So if you're going to do research with the countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, you could use them to inform yourself, to know what the policies are. Um, if, if anyone wants, we can do a live demonstration of how to go and pull out the documents, for example. But uh, the idea of this, of course, is to enable you to do better research and, and partnerships with Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, but, but we could look at other aspects of uh, things we could do, like uh, aligning and harmonizing capacity building efforts, like the ones that were done, were done in Colombia. We used to have one in the Caribbean in the future, so we could work on that together, and that's already been discussed. Um, the, the area of health system research, which I know is not the, the, the backbone of uh, what the NIH does, because uh, we have much more basic and clinical research here. But I know there's an interest, and I understand that, that Francis Collins has an interest in knowledge translation and making sure that the research findings are translated into policy and practice, and there's a lot of experience of know-how of networks in the region and in other regions that we're using for this. And the reason why we work as a network is when we develop uh, one of those resources you saw there, like the support tools, we make them available to all the regions. So the effort was, was, was that the work was done once, and then everybody can benefit from that. We get the people from the networks, from the EBITNET, for example, to get together once a year and share experiences from the different countries and, and how they sort the problems. So they, there's a, a shared learning. Um, so, so I think this is a summary, the key two elements I wanted to highlight here from the, how the policy and research for health is being implemented, and that's research governance, that we know what's being done in each country, that the people in the country can know about it, and look at the quality of what they're doing, because now they know what research is taking place, at least for the clinical trials at this stage. Um, they know what are the research institutions that have been registered, the ethics review committees. So now we can start looking at how to improve the quality, for example, of ethical review, or how to measure the standards of what they, they are doing, and how to work better with them. And the other aspect was knowledge translation, and that's what I wanted to to show you here, and I'm open. Uh, I would invite questions now, and if you need any demonstration, I'd be very happy to to do a live demonstration, looking for trials or or for information about the countries. Thank you very much.